2 Kings chapter 13. We, we ended before lunch uh, in 1 Kings now. <laughs> there's two ways. One of the kings invented a counterfeit religion, Jeroboam. It will become institutionalized. And within the very borders of the chosen people, there will be the true and the false. Now, when we progress here and we start to group some books together, 2 Kings and First and Second Chronicles, they're both about this king period we've been talking about, 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, you'll see the people's way versus God's way. Now there'll be struggles back and forth. You have Jerusalem, God's way, the house of David. You have man's way that you can get to also in Dan and Bethel. Relatives are involved in time and distance. And there's going to be the struggle of good and evil now that God's people are going to have to start making choices because they're both there, like exists in Christendom today. In the early New Testament, you could either be a Jew, a pagan, or a Christian. The Christian church in Ephesus, there was no 20 other churches next door to go to that said Christian. There is today. And so there's these choices to be made. You have uh, the people's way versus God's way. And, uh, uh, of course, you have another, the evil king and so on. Now, uh, we use this little thing to... uh, show uh, this battle that's going to go on in, in these books here. And I have you in 2 Kings 13 to show you that in the north, all the kings never, never departed from the institutionalized counterfeit religion. It became the heritage of grandma and grandpa. They were born into it. It became the religion of the north. For example, 2 Kings 13 and verse 1. 2 Kings 13 and verse 1 in the three and twentieth year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned seventeen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin, he departed not therefrom. No northern king will repent and do away with that religion. It will be the religion of the state. And I've skipped, there's a whole bunch of this, and I've skipped some already. But the measuring stick, no matter what else is done, is the religious sin of Jeroboam. Uh, God at times had mercy on a few, some people. Look at verse 6, or ver- verse 5, 13:5. And the Lord gave Israel a Savior so that they went out from under the hand of the Assyrians. And the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. And so sometimes he wouldn't even preserve them from annihilation. But look at verse 6. Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel uh, sin, but walked therein, and there remained the grove also in Samaria. Uh, Religious sin, brothers, the sins of Jeroboam. It wasn't murder. It wasn't stealing. You go down to verse 10, 2 Kings 13, 10. In the thirty and seventh year of Joash, king of Judah, you have this simultaneous report now, began Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned sixteen years. And, verse 11, he did evil, or that which was evil, in the sight of the Lord, and departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, but he walked therein. Not walking in the way of God walking in the religion of that day. Never mind what else happened in Israel. The measuring stick is, here's my truth, here's the false, and every king up there was evil. In fact, here's a little chart for you. And uh, Israel uh, had 20 evil kings, 20 evil kings. You get down to Judah, they had eight good kings, 11 evil kings, and one evil queen. So it was back and forth with the sons of David. Uh, uh, but, but here, zero good kings and 20 evil kings. Uh, there's your uh, little child's way of showing it all. Uh, all the sad faces for Israel. Well, you see a happy face. It's a simple way to do it, yeah. What's that? I just searched these things off Google and found them, brother. <laughs> And once in a while, you'll see there was something like uh, that the partially pleased God, but they didn't turn uh, from the sins of, uh, or they, didn't, they weren't completely good. So there's good, there's bad, there's a little bit of mixture. And here's the situation. 
But up north, it's institutionalized. It's a false religion all the way. And so you have this battle of good and evil, as we'll see. Reading more here, brothers. And uh, if you go to chapter 14, 2 Kings 14. And uh, look, look at verse 23, 2 Kings 14, 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, of Ju king of Judah, then it will switch to the northern kingdom, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned 40 and 1 years. Now, this is not the Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. This is another Jeroboam. Verse 24, And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, he departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. They never depart. They never depart. Uh, moving on to chapter 15, and now speaking of uh, uh, verse 8, verse 8, And in the thirty and eighth year of Ahaziah, king of Judah, did Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reign over Israel in Samaria six months. wasn't that long, but verse 9, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. You start to get the picture. Not walking in the ways of God, no matter what else they're involved in. And I'll just show you a little more on this. And I'm skipping a whole bunch, by the way. But you go to verse 23 of chapter 15. And in the 50th year of Azariah, the king of Judah, Pekiah, the son of Mahan, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned two years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Might have been popular among the people. Might have saw some advance among the people. But in the sight of the Lord. And today we talk about good popes and bad popes. and <laughs> They don't depart from the false gospel. False priesthood, false sacrifice. They don't depart from it. Never mind, well, this one's a good one. Here's the bottom line here. It's false. Uh, you go down to verse uh, uh, further on in chapter 15. Make it 17. Let's go to chapter 17 toward, at the end here. Commentary on the end here of northern Israel. And uh, as the Assyrians took them away, they lost their land. The, the, the Israeli empire fell in 1721. That is the reference, 2 Kings 17, 21. <clears throat> For he rent Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king, and Jeroboam drave Israel from following the Lord and made them sin a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, they departed not from them, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight. As he had said by the hand all his servants to prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. In that purge, the altar of Jeroboam got demolished. The priesthood bones were burnt on it as prophesied. God's judgment eventually fell on it. But for you know a couple, two, three hundred years, it continued here. And finally, God removed them out of that site. Now, as we're saying, while it existed, there's a battle of good and evil for the people of God. So, so let's go into the Chronicles now where you get some more of this history. If you go, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter 11. 2 Chronicles chapter 11, please. And, uh, and one, that, one that's originally happened, uh, um, uh, break in at verse 12, <coughs> rather verse 13. 2 Chronicles 11, verse 13. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coast. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest office unto the Lord. Jeroboam has the counterfeit. He doesn't need the Levitical priest. And they had suburbs where they lived up there, and he cast them off and made his own priesthood. We already learned that. Verse 15, And he ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils or demons and for the calves which he had made. There's a satanic spirit behind all this. Verse 16, And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts 
to seek the Lord God of Israel came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So, some decisions had to be made. I don't, I'm not a priest, or I'm way up here. Do I just go along with it, or do I, make, do I make the long trip, you know, by donkey, mule, walking many, many miles up to Jerusalem to sacrifice at the place that God has put His name? Today His name's on the Lord Jesus. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Is there a sacrifice? Some, they set their hearts, as you hear, to, to, to seek the Lord God of Israel and came to Jerusalem to sacrifice. They made the long trip. They went against the populace. They might have went against family. God notes them here in Scripture. And they strengthened the hand of Judah and Rehoboam for three years, etc. So that there's these choices to be made. In some cases, with the kings of uh, uh, Judah, at sometimes revival would come along. One of the great revival kings right here, and they have the little smiley face there, is, is Hezekiah. By the way, his son, Manasseh, was the worst king in all of Israel. He made Israel do worse than the heathen, it says in 2 Chronicles 33. They lived worse than the pagan, the people of God. You will see that good kings can have bad sons. And sometimes horrible kings has good sons. Uh, it's an amazing thing to watch here. But in the end of Hezekiah, or Manasseh's day, he ended up repenting, by the way, uh, after all that. But Hezekiah was a revival king. So let's go to chapter 30 and see this struggle continue here as he brought revival to Judah. Yeah, Second Chronicles, I'm 2 Chronicles chapter 30, please. Second Chronicles 30, and look, look at verse 1. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of God at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. A great revival happened. Passover's reinstituted down in Judah. And he sends letters to his fellow brother in Israel, Manasseh, Ephraim. That's the north part, by the way. And, and he says, we're going to have Passover. We're coming back to God. Verse 2, for the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. And so there's a revival. They're going to remember their, their salvation again, and they're going to keep the Passover unto the Lord. And so he sends these messengers out throughout the whole land of Israel. And uh, we'll break in on that. Um, <clears throat> look at verse 6. <clears throat> verse 6. So the post went, they call them post, like postmen. So the post went with the letters from the king and princes throughout all Israel and Judah. And according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. Uh, th that little remnant, you return to him, he'll come back to you. And be not like your fathers, verse 7, and like your brethren, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as ye see. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Come back to the house of God and do it his way. <laughs> Verse 9, For if ye turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive. So if they will come again into this land, for the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if ye return unto him. We're going to see that message later in the prophets. You return unto him. And he... he Come back, and he'll take you back. A gospel message, so to speak, going to the whole land here. So, verse 10, the post passed from city to city throughout the country of Ephraim, Manasseh, even to Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. They were so far away from you, like, there's one way and this. And, uh, uh, generations can become hard. And it's a joke to them, the gracious invitation. However, there's a small remnant, verse 11. Nevertheless, divers of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. It takes a humbling 
Lord, I'm wrong. You're right. They can, and also Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and the princes by the word of the Lord. So, brothers, there's always a remnant that seems to humble themselves. Choices to be made. To the most people, it was a joke. But you look and there's real people. And they say, I, I want to come back and do it God's way and he will have mercy on them. And because of these two ways now, that is the struggle throughout the prophets. That is the struggle in the Kings and Chronicles now of this God's way versus man's evil way, uh, the counterfeit. And, and there's times to shine for God and other people stay with the crowd. And uh, so what we have in this section, as we've been telling you, is the people way uh, versus God's way. And that's part of the big story of the Kings and the Chronicles. Now before we move on, looking at the broad overview, uh, on the way of the Lord, any comments on what we just talked about? Uh, you, could see, uh, you could see the temptation of doing that same thing today as a believer. You find it that the, in an assembly that practices the things that are prescribed in the New Testament is a mile away. How tempting it is that the church is 50 minutes away. Yeah. Yeah. All these things, but it's close, it's got things for the kids, and, you know, it pleases the people, not the Lord. Yeah. And God allows this, and somehow, it's a matter of the heart now. And to others, it's just a big joke. They, they laugh at it. You know, brothers, when you get to the New Testament, there is this type of call. We're told not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers in 2 Corinthians 6.14. And the house of idols is the context, the immediate context. Those exist today in Christendom. You know what 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says? Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. A call for separation. It might involve family. I've seen it involve family. And I will receive you. But God receives you. And that's the thing that keeps you going. Remember in Hebrews 13, 13, when Judaism became corrupt and rejected and crucified their Messiah and rejected a second chance to gospel preaching of the apostles. And Hebrews 10, 11 says, every priest and a daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. It was all a sham at this point. You know what he tells the Hebrew believers? Let us therefore go forth unto him, Hebrews 13, 13, without the camp bearing his reproach or shame. They're going to have to leave their heritage, leave the place that has crucified Christ, and, and gather, assemble with the Christians. Go forth unto him, because he suffered without the camp, he says. He went outside the gate and suffered. They rejected him. You're going to have to go to, a, to the despised Savior and bear his shame until he comes back. Outside the camp, let us therefore go forth unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. That's what was happening here. When we move on, we come to another phase, brothers, of Israel's history. Uh, phase three, not, not just in the land, not just a divided kingdom now, but we're going to see a remnant of the dispersion. They were dispersed for 70 years in Babylon. That is, Judah fell to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Uh, northern Israel fell early to Assyria and got scattered all over in intermixed marriages uh, and became known as the Samaritans and so on. But eventually Judah fell went away from God. The kings, did, you know, the kings uh, led to their destruction. And, and you're going to see a remnant, though, returns and rebuilds Israel's temple and wall. Uh, the first Jewish temple under Solomon was destroyed. In fact, go with me as we make this transition now to these history books. Go to 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36. As we, it gets set up for the next phase here. And I'll just uh, take you down to verse 14. And this is how Judah, Jerusalem now fell. Second Chronicles 36 and verse 14. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abomination of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his prophets, rising up 
be times, okay? Rising up, or, and that old word be times means continually and carefully. God never let up. And in his care, he would keep sending prophet after prophet. Rising up, verse 15, be times and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. God didn't destroy it right away. I mean, he went through bad and good. A long-suffering God. But, verse 16, they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. God's slow, slow in anger. But, you know, with our children, we've used expressions sometimes. I've had it up to here. Happens with the Lord. Can take no more. You look at verse 17. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, that's Nebuchadnezzar, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man, or him that stooped for age, he gave them all into his hand. Women, old men, a society being purged by the Babylonians. Verse 18. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and the princes of all these brought he to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. First temple, house of God's burnt. Why would he let that happen? Ezekiel says if he went on the inner walls of all kind of carvings of idols and images. Jealous God burns it up. Verse 20, and them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons till the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Ten years without a temple, without a nation, just a desolate piece of land uh, under the judgment of God. Now, with that said, God made promises to Israel. He made promises to David. The throne of David has stopped, but not the seat of David. And things are going to rebound. There's that Abrahamic covenant, the land. God never breaks a covenant. And so he works in that framework. And look at verse 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord has God be with him and let him go up. This one's not destroying Judah. God has moved Cyrus, a Persian, to say, God wants that house rebuilt, and he's going to use my authority to do it. You're welcome to go back. And so that, brothers, brings us to this third phase where Israel's second temple goes up, the rebuilding of the temple and wall, as recorded in the history books of uh, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah. And what we will see there is the right way is the way of the book. The right way is the way of the book. And what you'll see, Ezra was a scribe, Nehemiah uh, was a governor, a leader, and uh, Ezra was involved in the revival of the people, uh, Nehemiah and building the wall and so on. And before Ezra got there, the, the temple was rebuilt, and we're going to look at that in a minute. Uh, but what you're going to see amazing here, watch what happens. All this is going to happen with no king. <laughs> They've learned their lesson. To, the, 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 they're never going to go back to idolatry. I mean, this is a great embarrassment and purge of that whole chosen people out of their land, north and south. And uh, we're going to see in this return, this revival here, and just briefly in Ezra and Nehemiah, that the right way is the way of the book. So let's look at these two historical books here of the rebuilding of the second temple, the return of Israel to their land, uh, at least in the Judah area. Uh, going to Ezra chapter 3, just looking at the highlights, brothers. Zerubbabel was the governor that led the people back in these opening chapters, and the temple was built in stages. First you had the altar, then the foundation. They stopped, and they had to be exhorted through uh, 
Zechariah and Malachi, the, or Zechariah and Haggai, the prophets, and then they eventually put a structure on top of it. And then Nehemiah comes along and builds a wall, and Ezra comes along and instructs the people how to behave. Uh, this is all this revival, this recovery time, okay? But in chapter 3, they did something first. It's going to take a while to get a temple. It needs a foundation, like any building. It needs a structure so the priest can do the service of God. But before they do any of that, look at chapter 3 and verse 1. It gives you the names of those who returned and so on, uh, many of the names. In the chapter 3 and verse 1, they left Babylon and came back to a, not a tourist attraction, a desolated city that was burnt. There's going to be a lot of hard work. Enemies would be against them. This was a hard work, but they had a heart for God in this house. In verse 1, when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Yeshua, the son of Josedach, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, that's the governor, Yeshua, or Joshua's the priest, the son of Shatil, and his brethren, and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They had left the book. Wrath came from God. They left the book. They had another altar during the other kings. Uh, they, they didn't offer the offerings the right way. They had left the book. But now it's the way of the book. And what you're going to see happen here, uh, firstly, uh, there is this altar built, a place of sacrificing offering to God, like worship. You know. Uh, never mind the service of God, which is to happen. That will come later. But, but their hearts are back giving to God the blood sacrifice as it is written. The right way is the way of the book. Look at verse 3. And they set the altar upon his bases for to fear upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. And here's all these offerings going up to God, burnt offering peace offering, meal offering, all picturing the coming Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor, huh? Ephesians 5, 2. And, and so there's this heart for God and starting to worship God his way, going by the book again. Now, eventually, they'll build the foundation. And, of course, the foundation of the New Testament church is Jesus Christ. Sometimes we've got to get back to the gospel. And then they'll eventually build a structure on top of it where the service of God happens. The priest goes into that first part accomplishing the service of God, the Bible says. So all these things are good. But it's going to go by the book now, but it starts with hearts offering up to God. And sometimes, you know, when the revival happened in the 1800s, the recovery of the church, we call it now the New Testament Assembly, you know what it started with? The Lord's Supper. <laughs> the Lord's the remembrance of the Lord Jesus, taking up with him. Then all kind of things came from that and so on. But, but it was a simple return to the Lord's Supper for the one body. Amazing. You read it in church history. But, but as you go on here, you go to chapter 7 of Ezra, after the temple is built. And by the way, in between chapter 6 and 7, the building of the temple and the next return of Israel to uh eventually build the wall and all that. That's when the book of Esther happened, which we'll get to when we get to Esther. Uh, but right now we're in chapter 7. Esther happens between 6 and 7 here of Ezra. But we get to Ezra chapter 7, and uh, just looking at verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgment. Here comes a man now going to lead a people back now, now at the temples there, another wave of return is happening. And he has a prepared heart. I want to do it your way, God. And the, you remember, we talked about, I did it my way. I did it. A heart to seek the Lord and to te teach Israel. He wants to get back to the book. You go to chapter 8 as he brings this group back. Take you to verse 21 of Ezra 8. Verse 21. He says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek him a right way for us and for our little ones 
and for our substance. Seeking a right way to do things. What a re refreshment after the apostasy of the kings in Israel. Chastisement works sometimes. Uh, then I proclaim and fast that we might afflict ourselves before God to seek a uh, They're going to fast. He proclaimed to fast, afflict, and confess anything because they're, they're in trouble here. I was ashamed to require the king a band of horsemen to help against the enemy. The enemy's in the way, and we fasted, and God delivered them. And you read that in the context. But afflicting themselves means humbling, confessing, and so on, brother. Yeah. Yeah, it's a humble attitude. 821 that we might uh, find a right way for us and for our little ones. Not only them, their families. Now, as you get to the next book, Nehemiah, Ezra is still a key player. Nehemiah is the governor, but Ezra is the teaching scribe priest. And as this revival continues, and the wall, now the temple is complete, and now the wall is going up, uh, I want to show you what happens here in chapter 8. The right way is the way of the book here. We'll give you a little picture of it here. In verse 1, this happens at the water gate. The wall's up. You have gates now. The enemy, God's people inside can be protected in the temple. Uh, there's a separation between them and the enemy now but because that wall does that. In verse 1, chapter 8, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Let's get the book. Let's get the law. Look, verse 3. Maybe somebody could read verse 3, please. Okay. What verse did you read? Yeah, that was very good, too. I wanted three. Uh, all that can hear with understanding, a little baby two years old can't, but you get someone young enough that can understand what's being said, yes. Yeah. Uh, verse three, and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until the midday before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Ears for the book. Now, look at verse 5. Verse 5, brothers. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. So uh, it's kind of like the modern way of the pulpit. He's above the people, and he opens the book, the scrolls. And... Uh, Verse 6, and he blessed, and Ezra blessed the Lord and the great God, and all the people answered. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And so worship is produced. Sometimes the preaching of the word can produce worship also. You look at verse 8. So they read in the book the law of God distinctly and gave the sense, that is the meaning and caused them to understand the reading. Yes, they read, but like we're doing, we try to give the sense, the meaning. And that's what preaching's about, brother. Not inventing things, just giving the sense what God means. And so they're getting back to the book. Now, now look, look at verse 14 of chapter 8 of Nehemiah. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses uh, that the children of Israel should dwell in booze in the feast of the seventh month. Now, this is a wonderful thing. They're searching the book. They look at that. We're not doing that anymore. We need to do that again on this exact day. We've quit doing that. And that's what happened in the 1800s when a revival swept different places, and they started remembering the Lord, and they started searching the Scriptures. Here's how the church should meet. And they got back to the book, and they discovered things. And this is what's happening here. The right way is the way of the book. Now look at how the chapter closes, chapter 8 and verse 18. Also, day by day, from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly unto the manor. And so, they're back to the book. They're worshiping God. The wall has been built. Wall of protection keeps evil out, keeps those inside protected. Uh, and we, we mentioned in our earlier comments in this study, wherever there's a formal place of God dwelling, there's a wall. Tabernacle had a wall. 
uh, Millennial Temple is going to have a wall. Solomon's Temple had a wall. Nehemiah, Ezra's Temple has a wall. New Jerusalem has a wall. Church has an inside and outside, 1 Corinthians 5. Don't, don't let that bother you, brother, that's of God, okay? Uh, for the right reasons, that is. So what we've discovered here is in Ezra and Nehemiah, no king involved, just men with hearts for God, and there's a return of the remnant to the ways of God. The right way is the way of the book. And brothers, when we get to the New Testament, you say, but we got the Spirit. Listen to Paul write to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 14, 37. Gives them church order. Uh, head covering for the woman, no head covering for the man. Uh, at certain times, uh, Lord suffered us in the centrality of Christ, you know. Plurality of priesthood, how the gifts work together, the plurality. Women silent in the churches under the order of God. And he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, the things that I write unto you, write, are the commandments of the Lord. We have the written word of God. The things that I write. Go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 1, please. Revelation 1. The letter to the seven churches from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And if you like to pronounce the name of the churches, you can read Revelation 111, please, somebody. Revelation 111. Lord Jesus says, what you see, write in a book. We have a book. By the way, it's called the New Testament. <laughs> we got a book. This is the book of Revelation. Write. Now, you do know that he says to all seven churches, such as in Revelation 2, 7, Ephesus being the first, this phrase in verse 7, verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. It says that to all seven. Not he that hath an eye look around at the other nations, religions, and what they do. He that hath a heart, whatever feels good. He that hath an ear, listen to what the Spirit's saying. But that is not some new voice that's going to give you personal direction. Uh, that, that is simply enlightening you to the book. For before he says that to any of the churches, look at Revelation 2.1, the church at Ephesus. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. And every church he'll say, right, right, right. They had letters. They had a book. Now listen to what the Spirit's saying. For what the Spirit is saying is enlightening the written Word of God. So we have a book. It's not legalism. We're not under the law. But there is a book to please God and instruction to the churches. And the right way, brothers, as Israel found out under Ezra and Nehemiah, men like that, the right way is a way of the book. And the Lord Jesus said, John, put it in a book. So we need to get back to the book, back to the book. Brother uh, Dan. Um, In the book. And that day you will, you can understand yeah. the revelation. You don't have to try to understand it here. I, I think the question I have right now is, <laughs> we can I understand? I'm going to go plant my seed and plant I do too. Yeah, I, I, I understand, brother. That's a good thing. It don't matter where we are. We'll take the book and we'll take it. Th that's right, brother. That's why you can tell. That, that's right. Yeah, we, we, can, we, we can do it uh, personally before God too, brother. Uh, that, that's right. Uh, but to see God's people rejoicing what's in the book. Uh, we live in a day, most of us, uh, the majority of those uh, that we are with are finding ways to depart from the book. It's a tough battle. But now and then, you, there's still a remnant as we travel around. We see some older ones, we see some younger ones. And they say, brother, give us the book. They're still out there. They're not as many maybe as they used to. And, and it keeps the wind in our sails. <laughs> keeps the wind in our sails. And... Uh, 
You want to look for that in your assembly and people you're working with. There's still God has a little group that still wants the book, okay? For the book is the word of God. The right way is the way of the book. Now, brothers, I don't see any more hands. What we'll do is uh, Joe has a hand. Verse what, brother? No, they had a repentance. Yeah. That that's right, brother. Before the joy, there had to be the mourning, yeah. a time to cry, a time to laugh. Uh, uh, but yeah, thank you, Joe, for that. That was good. What we'll do, brother? This is break time. When we reassemble, I'm going to do the Book of Esther. It won't take that long. That'll set us up for the next cluster of poetic books and the prophets as the days move on, the day moves on. But at this point, and then after I do the book of Esther, we'll turn it over to the brethren for open time. But it's decision time, Brother Rich. What was your decision?